Let us worship God and sing to his praise from Psalm 50, the first version of Psalm 50, verses 5 to 8. And the tune is St. Bride, which is tune number 171. Psalm 50, verses 5 to 8. Together let my saints unto me gathered be, those that by sacrifice have made a covenant uh, with me. We'll sing verses 5 to 8. Stand and seek God's face in prayer. Almighty and ever blessed God in heaven, you are the king that sits upon the circle of the earth, and you are the one who reigns as omnipotent. And you, O Lord, look upon all of the earth, the nations, and all of their vaunting uh, hubris and power, and you say they are like dust that is in the balance. You look upon great men, and you say that the inhabitants of the world are as grasshoppers. All is laid low before you. There is a God. There is none that can be compared unto you, the living and the true God. Teach us, O Lord, like you taught uh, your servant Job of, of old, that we would be enabled to. Uh, to see more fully uh, the glory that belongs to you. We, O oh Lord, cannot be asked such high questions. Where were we when the foundation of the earth was laid? And where were we when the stars were set in their course in heaven? O oh Lord, we, we were not in existence and had not the power ourselves. We must clasp our hands over our mouths and humble ourselves to acknowledge that we are as worms and to abhor our flesh. O Lord, we come humbling then our own selves before you, trusting that you will exalt us in due time. And we ask, O God, that you would forgive us our sins. We, we are those who have so often forsaken uh, the fountain of living water 
and we have hewn for ourselves cisterns, broken cisterns, which can hold no water. Oh, what folly belongs to us to turn from uh, you, the, the God of heaven, and your ways, and to turn in our own mischief and foolishness to the things that are made of our own hands. Oh God, we confess and bewail these sins before you and pray that you would make us wise and purge our, our folly and grant, Lord, that you would uh, cleanse us from our many iniquities. May we be those who are crying out that you would plow up the fallow ground and that you would rain down righteousness and mercy upon us. O Lord, cause your doctrine to fall as distilled dew on new mown grass. Uh, we pray that you would be pleased to, uh, with the pardon of sins that is to be found in Christ, that you would also uh, give grace for us to be killing and mortifying the remaining sin that is present within our souls, that we would be waging a holy war uh, against sin in ourselves. Help us, O oh God, to see how desperately we need your grace. We, we all too often uh, flatter ourselves, and we think more highly of ourselves than we ought, and we are to be ashamed for such. O oh Lord, forgive us and grant mercy to us. We thank you for uh, providing for us uh, the truth. We are thankful, O oh Lord, that it is eternal truth, unbreakable truth, uh, that it is truth which is fixed and firm, a truth which cannot be uh, pushed back or overthrown. Grant that you would sanctify us by this truth. And grant, O oh Lord, that we would lay up and hide this truth in our hearts, your word, that we might not sin against you. Lord, we ask that you would bless us in this season as a congregation. You have caused us to go forth with rejoicing and the baptism of a covenant child. And for this, uh, to extol you as a God who makes uh, covenant promises. And we do so. We do praise you for these mercies. And you have also laid us low with grief, uh, which we have borne under the heat of the day in the uh, struggles with uh, sin and the, the loving uh, necessity of, of censure and the church. O oh Lord, we pray that you would accompany uh, this by the presence of your Holy Spirit and that you would manifest your love in it, and that you would be pleased to bring forth abundant fruit in those under censure and in all of us as a whole, that we would profit and benefit, that we would come under it, and that we would improve your dealings with us uh, as a people by your grace. We commend ourselves into your tender care uh, with such matters. Uh, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless the work of uh, the spread of the gospel of, of Christ Jesus. Uh, we think of our own nation and the need, yet you, O oh Lord, have not left us in the dark. There are uh, churches preaching Christ crucified and a good measure, if not the whole counsel of your word, and many, many communities and villages and cities and in the country, throughout our region, and throughout our state, but Lord, throughout the whole country. And we, we pray that you would be pleased to revive uh, your work in these days, that you would send the, the early and the latter rain unto us, uh, that you would restore unto us the, the years that the locusts uh, have eaten, and that you would bring down blessing from heaven to the conversion of sinners, that, uh, that we would see you coming forth in the day of your power and bringing many out of sin and into saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray for that corner of our country in Washington State. We think of Seattle and of its, uh, the secularism which abounds there and the, the relative uh, few uh, gospel preaching churches in contrast to other places and we ask that you would yet brighten the light of the of the candle of your people in that place uh, that that you would be pleased O lord to uh, to make deep inroads into those uh, communities 
and for good, sound, reformed churches to be established and those that exist to be strengthened and increased all to your praise. Well, Lord, we thank you for giving us the ordinances of worship and for the privilege we have this afternoon to take them up, uh, to be able to handle holy things, uh, to be able to see our own souls nourished and strengthened in them. Bless the singing, reading, and preaching of your word, and may it be to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Sing together from Psalm 7, verses 6 to 11. Psalm 7, verses 6 to 11. The tune is Harrisfield, which is number, tune number 72. Notice verses 10 and 11 at the end of this section. In God who saves the upright in heart is my defense and stay. God just men judgeth. God is wroth with ill men every day. We'll sing verses seven, uh, verses 6 to 11. Our Old Testament reading is found in 2 Kings chapter 8. So I ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me there to 2 Kings chapter 8. Then spake Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise and go thou in thine household, and sojourn 
uh, wheresoever thou canst sojourn, for the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. The woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years' end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. And it came to pass, as he was telling the king, how he had restored a dead body to life, that, behold, the woman, whose son he had restored to life, cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. When the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, uh, the king of, of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God is come hither. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go, meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels' burden, and came and stood before him, and said, Thy son, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? And Elisha said unto him, Go, say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover, howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Hazael said, Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel, and their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, but what, is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What said Elisha to thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shouldst surely recover. And it came to pass on the morrow that he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it on his face, so that he died, and Hazael reigned in his stead. And in the fifth year of Joram, uh, the son of uh, Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, Jehoram, uh, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him uh, to give him always a light unto his children. In his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah, and made a king over themselves. So Joram went over to Zire, and all the chariots with him, and he, arose, and he rose by night, and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about. And the captains of the chariots and the people fled into their tents. Yet Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah unto this day. Then Libna revolted at the same time, and the rest of the acts of Joram and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Joram slept with his fathers and was buried uh, with his fathers in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, 
did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, begin to reign. Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, for he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, uh, king of Syria, and Ramoth Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. And King Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. Let's continue to worship the Lord by singing praise to him from Psalm 7, and we'll sing verses 12 to 17. So Psalm 7, verses 12 to 17, the tune is St. Kilda, which is tune number 116. Notice how God so skillfully undoes the plotting and mischief of those who oppose him. In verse 15, he made a pit and digged it deep, another there to take, and he has fallen into the ditch which he himself did make. We'll sing verses 12 to the end of the psalm to tune 116.
Our New Testament reading is found in Matthew chapter 10, Gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Let us give careful attention to the reading of this God's holy word. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go hence. When ye come into an house, salute it, and if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in, this, in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the child shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known." What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. And I am come to set a man at variance 
against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. As far the reading of God's holy word. This afternoon we come in our exposition of 2 Kings to chapter 8. We've read the whole chapter together already this afternoon in our service, and we'll be considering the first half, which is found in verses 1 to 15. 2 Kings 8, verses 1 to 15. It opens with these words, Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou in thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. It seems in reading through First and Second Kings that we are confronted again and again and again with one wave after another of perilous circumstances. But we've also noted all the way along that the Lord has also sprinkled these wonderful displays of his grace and goodness, of his love uh, toward his people. Some of the most um, attractive Uh, inspiring miracles of the Old Testament are scattered like diamonds uh, through these passages. But they sit against some extreme uh, difficulties, times of spiritual apostasy and declension, uh, times of of, uh, political brutality and persecution, times of unrest and difficulty. And yet in these things we found the Lord, as we continue to find and will always find the Lord, uh, to be ruling and overruling. And he is both the giver of life and the giver of death. Uh, We see both the severity of God and the goodness of God. And these things are woven together in his uh, dealings with mankind throughout the annals of history. As we come to chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 15, you'll notice that while there's much talk about Elisha, even the Shunammite woman, even Hazael and his assassination of Ben-Hadad and, and the other players, God is the one, as always, who features centrally and prominently in the passage before us. God is the one who is speaking. God is the one who is dealing uh, with his, his people One thing that you won't know, but I'll point out to you, is that the same uh, Hebrew word, uh, cheya, is found eight times in these these verses. In verse 1, verse 5, verse 8, verse 9, 10, 14, and so on. The English word is to restore or to recover. So eight times we have the reinforcement of this. In the, the first section... Uh, Verses 1 to 6, it's used four times. Second section, it's used four times as well. But in the first section, it's speaking about the Lord's restoration or recovery, primarily of the Shunammite's circumstances, her well-being. In the second half, while it's speaking about the recovery of Ben-Hadad, it in fact is bringing a message of gloom and punishment 
uh, to him, and really judgment ultimately uh, to Israel. But in both, both in restoration and ruin, God is the one who is the giver. So we'll note uh, a few things here this afternoon. First of all, three things. First of all, God's kindness brings joy. Verses 1 to 6. God's kindness brings joy. We have those first two verses, verses 1 and 2. And the Shunammite woman has appeared again uh, on, on the surface of, of history. And we're, we're reading about her. This is the woman whom we read about and preached about earlier, whose son had died. Uh, you'll remember that she had taken notice of, of Elisha as a holy man, a man of God. And she had spoken to her husband, and they had created a, an addition uh, to the house that he would be able to use as he frequently passed by there. So she was seeking to show kindness to him. And, and Elisha came to her in response and said, all these times you've, you've shown kindness, what can I do? And she says, in essence, nothing. But Gehazi says, well, uh, she needs uh, a child. She's barren. And, and so he prophesies of the fact that she would bear a child. That child grows up and then dies. Remember, he has the pain in his head. He's in the field with his father. He runs to his mother and dies in her lap. And Elisha again is called upon, and he comes and restores the life of the child. It's that woman that's being spoken of here at the, in the opening uh, verses. And what we see is a, a kindness, kindness of preventing hardship. So rather than even delivering one out of hardship, it is actually the prevention of hardship on her behalf. So the prophet comes and he provides counsel to her. He's basically, he's giving her a forewarning, the insider scoop, if you will. He says, famine is coming. In fact, seven years of famine are coming. And you would do well to sojourn. You need to, to take off. You need to get out of this area and find a place where you can avoid uh, the famine. So flee, in essence, for safety. What is this? This is God's goodness and mercy following this woman all the days of her life. So it's not just one mercy or two mercies. God is continuing to pursue this woman with goodness and mercy. So now we find her in the beginning, seeking first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. That's what she was busy about. She had set her heart and mind on what was central to the Lord's concerns, central to God's glory. She had sought first the kingdom and righteousness, and she had served the Lord's servant. And now we see the Lord doing what he said. I will add all these other things unto you. He's saying, I will care uh, for you. In fact, we read from Matthew 10, because at the end, among other things, at the end of that chapter, Jesus is teaching, and he says, if you give a cup of cold water to a little one, then you will receive a reward. So a cup of cold water given in the name of a disciple, much less the name of the Lord himself, as we see elsewhere, will receive its reward. Here is the keeper of Israel. He hasn't forgotten her. His kindness is continuing to pursue her. And it doesn't stop here, as we see in verses 3 to 7. God's kindness continues to bring joy. She escapes the famine, and then after the seven years of famine are over, she begins to, to leave Philistia and to return home. But when she returns home, she discovers that someone has confiscated her property, absconded with her, her goods, and she is grieved. She's bereft of these things. And so she marches off to the king to make complaint. Well, meanwhile, uh, Gehazi and the king are in this uh, dialogue with one another. And you, you have to remember here, I've mentioned this in a pre previous uh, sermon, but these chapters are not chronological, right? especially, especially chapters 2 to 8. It's more of a theological um, 
a theological arrangement where the Lord is building on a theme as he discloses what's taken place in history. So you compare this, for example, to what we saw in chapter 5. So in other words, what we are reading about here in chapter 8, verses 3 and following is something that took place before Naaman's visit and Gehazi's response to Naaman and his leprosy. Obviously, if Gehazi had leprosy, he would not be permitted access to the king and to be dialoguing uh, in person with the king. He's unclean and he's contagious. So, but back to the, the text, there's this vivid scene. So the king is coming to... to to Elisha's servant Gehazi, and he says, tell me three times, right? Three times in verses four, five, and six, tell me, tell me about the works of Elisha. Now, he knew about some of them himself, Jehoram, right? He knew what, what uh, he had experienced some of the benefits, even himself, but he wanted to know the other stuff, the juicy stuff, maybe the stuff that wasn't public, things like, for example, the healing of the Shunammite son, and perhaps a whole host of other things. And so here is Gehazi, and he is regaling the king with these stories, and he begins to tell him about the Shunammite son being raised from the dead back in chapter 4, what, what we heard about back in chapter 4, verses 8 and following. And all of the sudden, there is shock that reverberates through Gehazi and through the room. As he's, dis as he's discussing this account with the king, she appears in their presence. And so here she is. And, of course, this reminds us that uh, in providence, it is God that sets the timing, doesn't he? God is orchestrating, you know, b b you know billions and trillions and quadrillions of all of these minute details and he's weaving them all together to bring to pass his purposes he's ordering it all perfectly he's ordering it often in ways that are unexpected uh, to us but it is God's timing and so he brings about the question from the king the answer from Gehazi and the difficulties of the Shunammite and her appearance and they all converge at this one place and time. So the king turns to her and says, tell me what has happened. And she rehearses the same story to him. And the king responds by appointing an officer to go and to restore her land. So thus far, we're seeing God's kindness bringing joy. The Lord prevents difficulty in her life on one occasion. And then he's delivering her out of difficulty on a subsequent occasion. The Lord is himself visiting her, pursuing her, caring for her, shielding her, delivering her, and so on. But we shouldn't pass from this without thinking a little about the king. Because the king, of course, has himself received blessings. Go back to chapter 3. Look at chapters 6 and 7. The king has certainly received blessings. Remember what we've just heard about. He's at the brink of annihilation in the previous text, and he's saying it's finished, and he's ripped his clothes, and Elisha is saying to him, all will be totally different tomorrow at this time. And he says, there's no way, not even if the windows of heaven were opened up, right? So the Lord has been bringing blessing to him and his people, and the king is accountable for that. The king is accountable to God for those things. And what, what we should note is the king does not change. The goodness of God does not lead him to repentance. In 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, we're told uh, about Jehoram. Nevertheless, he cleaved under the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin, he departed not therefrom. The king does not repent and believe. The king does not change as a result of all that he's seen and all that he has just heard 
in addition to what he himself has seen. What's happening? He's impressed, but it is unimproved by him. So he wants to be wowed, give me the, you know, the, the, the shocking, thrilling, you know, accounts that will uh, get me excited and, and, um, and hit my adrenaline and so on. I want to hear all of the, the wonder-working things that have taken place. It's the same stuff that people crave today with the televangelists and the charismatic movement. They want shock and awe. You know, there's got to be more of some sort of thrilling false miracles that they uh, content themselves with. He's impressed, but he's not, he's not improved by them. In other, word, in other words, he's, he has a fascination, but not faith. He doesn't believe, and his heart is not drawn to the Lord. Well, and that needs to be noticed. God's kindness has been manifest in this passage, but there are men that can even recognize the power of the gospel. They see, they can see the influence, impact, you know, the power of the gospel without receiving it themselves. They don't receive it. They can note it. They can say, wow, this is some of the great preachers in history had unbelieving people who went to hear them and were impressed but untouched by it. So that's possible for men to recognize even the power of the gospel, to, to hear testimony to it without receiving it themselves. They're intrigued by the gospel without being converted by the gospel. And that's true of Jehoram in this passage. So God's kindness brings joy. Secondly, God's truth brings fear. God's truth brings fear. Verses 7 to 10. So the scene changes now. Elisha has come to Damascus. And he is greeted with this, this big question, a, bi a question from Ben-Hadad uh, that is sent to Elisha by, uh, by his servant uh, Hazael. And the question is, will I recover from this illness? So they've heard that the man of God has come, verse 7, Verse 8, shall I recover of this disease? And we read the answer. Hazael comes, uh, greets uh, Elisha, and he asks them the question again in verse 9. And the answer in verse 10 puzzles us. Like, what, what, is, what does this mean? What, what exactly is happening here? And Elisha said unto him, go, say unto him, thou mayest certainly recover, Howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. So what, what exactly is the answer? And what, what exactly is being conveyed uh, to Ben-Hadad? Well, the answer is yes and no. The answer is both yes and no. Thou mayest certainly recover. It's a way of saying, well, if... If you were left to normal circumstances, or all things being equal, if you will, then you would recover. You would, you would naturally recover from this, this illness. That would be the case. But, no. You will not recover because Elisha knew that Hazael would actually use the illness in order to stage a coup and would assassinate the king. And so he says, yes, thou mayest recover, certainly recover. You would if you were left to yourself, but you're not going to. You're going to die because you're going to be assassinated, as we come to see in the verses that follow. But the emphasis, really, is not on the puzzle of verse 10. The emphasis is on the words, the Lord hath showed me in verse 10. Howbeit the Lord, that is Jehovah, hath showed me. It's repeated again in verse 13. He's saying, he'll die, and you, Hazael, will become king. You will be made a king. So this takes us all the way back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. 
and verses 15 to 17. This is before Elisha's uh, rise as prophet. It's back in the days of Elijah, right? J-A-H, Elijah. And when Elijah was on Mount Horeb, here in 1 Kings 19, he is told that he will anoint three instruments that would serve as, as instruments of judgment to Israel, that is, to God's own people, Hazael, Jehu, and Elisha. So here we see the progress of this, this account given all the way back in Elijah's day. And what's happening here in chapter 8 is significant because Elisha is moving from a ministry of grace, which has been the predominant theme in chapters 10 through 7. And there's a transition here at the beginning of chapter 8 from a, a, a prophet of grace to a prophet of judgment, just as Elijah said would be the case. And really from chapters 8, 9, and 10, we see that uh, borne out. So God's truth uh, brings fear. God is saying, this is what will happen. The king will surely die. Now, there's more than that going on. It's not just about Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, or Hazael, who's going to take his seat, his throne. Israel is what is ultimately in God's sight, as we'll see more. Israel has been sinning away its mercies. Right? We've had all of these accounts of God's patience, forbearance, provision, kindness, and so on through uh, the previous chapters, both to individuals among the remnant as well as corporately to the, the, the people as a whole. Sir, uh, Samaria, last time in the last chapter, Samaria as a whole benefited from the provisions that God had, had made to them, made for them. Israel is hardening under it and sinning against it and forsaking uh, their own mercies. When God speaks, my friends, we must fear him. You'll know the words of Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2. For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. God is saying, I will note, and my people will be special objects of my attention when they are clothed with humility and when they tremble at my word. When God speaks, where to feel, uh, fear him. Often, and this isn't unique to our own day, often the Lord's word is treated like a tidbit. Just, you know, a tidbit here and a tidbit there. That, that people, perhaps you, feel like you can bounce around. And you can consider it, and you can think about it, well, I like this part, but I don't like this part. Or I'm going to receive this part, but I'm going to reject this part. Or I'm going to take this part, and rather than following what God has said, I'm going to twist and misapply it in a way that suits me. This does not reflect meekness. God says that we are to receive the engrafted word with meekness. It does not reflect humility as one receiving the word from the king of heaven. It does not, refa it does not reflect a genuine faith in saying, let God be true, though all men are liars, and standing by God's word. When God speaks, we're to fear him. When God's word is being read and preached, we are to attend it with the reverence that God himself is due. He reveals himself through his word, and his word is to be received as he himself is to be received. Now, to our own circumstances, God's word also comes to us in, in censure. So we've, we're dealing with this as a congregation uh, today. We have been dealing with this. This is God's word. God is the one who is speaking uh, to us uh, through that censure. And we're to reverence it. Right? We, we are to 
We're to fear the Lord. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. There's to be sobriety. There's to be the fear of the Lord in receiving his word there as well. That means fearing God, not just fearing personal embarrassment. Right? That, that's all about us but rather fearing the Lord and honoring him and his his glory. So God's truth brings fear. Thirdly, God's judgment brings sorrow, verses 11 to 15. Verses 11 to 15, God's judgment brings sorrow. Notice these words, verse 11, and he settled his countenance steadfastly, until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. So, Elisha has just told Hazael, you are, you know, Ben-Hadad is going to die. Now, Elisha knows how he's going to die. He's going to die at the hand of the one he's speaking to, Hazael. And so what's described in verse 11 is Elisha fixing his gaze on Hazael, seeing through him. He is staring him down until Hazael is ashamed. Hazael is ashamed at the look of the prophet. And that's reinforced somewhat in what follows. But then the prophet bursts into weeping. He bursts into tears. And the man of God wept. And Hazael said, Why weepeth my Lord? Why weepeth my Lord? So Hazael is disturbed by it. And then we find the reason. What's going on in Elisha's heart? What is it that's behind this torrent of, of tears? Verse 12 Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children and rip up their women with child. I mean, these are grievous, very grievous, very alarming words. Hazael's response is kind of a mixture of being puzzled and perhaps excited. He says, but what? Is thy thy servant a dog? But notice there's an excitement that he should do this great thing. So there's a mix that's there. Well, Elisha says, you will be king over Syria and you will afflict Israel. And Hazael gets up and then takes matters into his own hands and says, I'll, I will do this my way. And he ultimately, of course, fulfills God's prophetic word. And so in verse 15, he takes a thick cloth, dips it in water, and then takes it, spreads it over the face of King Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, and smothers him, suffocates him, uh, murders him, assassinates him. But we need to come back to to Elisha's sobs, Elisha's sorrows, his tears. When he describes what he does in verse 12, he is feeling deep, heart-rending, acute pain. He's feeling pain, and he can't help but manifest it. Tears come forth. And there's, there's a couple of things happening here. Elisha loves God supremely. He loves God supremely. And he knows that God is a righteous judge and that he must bring a, a righteous chastening to his apostate people. So it's not, it's not as if Elisha doesn't want that to happen. Elisha wants God's name vindicated, God's glory upheld, Uh, and God's people purified. His love 
for God would motivate all of those things. But he also loves his people. He also loves Israel. And there is sadness at the consequence that comes from this divine chastening. There's deep sadness that comes as a consequence of this divine chastening. Behold both the goodness and the severity of God. Elisha has that. He's captured that. It's, it's as if sorrow is being mixed with submission. So he has love for God's glory first, but then he also has love for the Lord's people, and he, he, it pains him to see them. You know, as those of you who have been parents or those of you who have been children and grown up with, with siblings, if you, if you had some, children, of course, cry when they get disciplined. So they're disciplined and they cry. But what's interesting is that sometimes their siblings cry, but when they're, they're not when the, the siblings are being disciplined themselves, but when they see their brother or sister disciplined, right? So the one being disciplined is crying, but the children observing that discipline also sometimes are led to cry as well. And that's, that's being captured here in, in the example of Elisha. You know, we, we must, like Elisha, we must fully um, uphold uh, God's chastening and vindicate and stand for his glory. But we must also f- fully grieve over the cost that that brings uh, to us and to the Lord's people generally. Sin must bring grief if we're seeing it correctly. We can't be indifferent. We can't be casual and, and uh, untouched, unaffected by sin. We can't be. Sin brings grief, and it must bring grief if we have any consciousness of what it is at all. And so here is Hazael, who's no doubt thrilled about his ascension to the throne, And in contrast, there is Elisha who is saddened. He knows Israel must be chastened. It is a necessity, but it is also a grief. It is also a deep grief to him. In the prophet Ezekiel, we read these words in chapter 33. And verse 11, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? It's a parallel passage. I mean, speaking to the people of God, the house of Israel, God is saying, I don't have, there's not a fiendish delight in the death of the wicked. He's calling for their repentance to turn from their evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? But ultimately, this this brings us uh, to, to point to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. If you look, if you'll remember the words of Luke chapter 19, Uh, verses 41 and following. So you think of Elisha, here he is weeping over the destruction of Israel. Now look at the parallel passage in Luke 19 and verse 41 and following. And when he, that is Christ, this is Jesus, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, 
because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ weeping over Jerusalem. He's weeping over them. We can't read about Elisha in this text without being led to the one who is greater than Elisha and the disclosure of Christ's heart and will in relationship to the same theme. Sin must bring grief to us. God's judgment, God's chastening brings sorrow. But we don't lose sight of his love, the love of a father that is behind it. We know that even in the sorrows that come, that there is love that brings these things to pass. Very well-known passage, Hebrews chapter 12, where it says in verse 6, now, verse 5, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? The Lord is saying this is his love and turning his people, bringing them to be aware of the reality and, 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 and threatening dangers of sin and to turn them from that sin uh, out of that way that leads to destruction and to turn them to flee through the, the narrow gate that leads to life and to Christ himself. So as you, as you take in this, the whole passage, you see the Lord is both the giver of life and the giver of death. I mean, Ben-Hadad is going to die as a king, and the Lord is the one who's holding all of these things in his hand. We see the Lord pursuing his people with love, with goodness, with kindness, with mercy. In the example of the Shunammite, we see the Lord bringing his word, which should impart reverence and fear of God in receiving that word. And we see that God's chastening brings sorrow with it, as exemplified in Elisha, but seen even more perfectly and fully in the Savior himself. God is all and in all. Let's stand together for prayer. O Lord, our God in heaven, enable us to behold both the goodness and severity of God. Grant that we uh, would be led to rejoice with great joy over the bounty and goodness that you deliver to us. But may that be mixed as well with the fear of your holy name that is necessary in receiving your word. And grant, Lord, that we would be enabled to grieve when and where we ought to grieve in the chastening that we receive at your hand. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us through these means and to conform us into the likeness of your own beloved Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 147. Psalm 147, verses 11 to 17. The tune Hamilton, which is number 71, tune 71. Psalm 147, beginning at verse 11. But in all those that do him fear, the Lord doth pleasure take, and those that to his mercy do by hope themselves betake. Yeah. Hey. 
stand for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace.